Sorry about that. All right, so if you uh, looked in your handout, we're talking about a subject that I think we are all uh, familiar with, we've heard of. Uh, you know, we, I think we all kind of understand, you know, the, the point, you know, what about musical instruments? Uh, we understand that we don't use instrumental music in worship. We obviously have just sung, you know, a cappella uh, music, or yeah, a cappella without the accompaniment of instruments in our singing. We just sang with our voices. Uh, again, we, we know this pretty well, uh, but again, as we sort of talked about a couple weeks ago, there are some things that we, 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 we know a position on, but we may not always be able to explain it, uh, maybe quite as well as we would like to. And that's what we want to think about this morning as it pertains to the usage of musical instruments in worship, right? Because to many people in the world, uh, this is the defining difference for us, right? That's what separates the Church of Christ from the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, Catholicism, uh, whatever church it is. Generally, uh, people that have a religious background know the Church of Christ as the church that doesn't use musical instruments, uh, that is really our defi- that, that is one of the most defining features that we, uh, that we know. If we've talked to anybody about religion, we told them about that we are members of the Church of Christ. It's generally one of the first things that comes up, right, about musical instruments and why we don't use it. Uh, we do want to talk about the fact that, though, while this is an important issue, there are, there are other uh, important differences for us uh, in, in relation to how we compare to other to other groups that claim Christianity, right? Think about the question, how does one become a Christian, right? It doesn't matter if you get the question right about musical instruments. If you never properly obey the gospel, it doesn't matter because that's the first step, right? We understand that there are a lot of different positions about how does one become a Christian. That's why we emphasize at the end of our lessons the steps that, it, that are necessary in order to become a Christian, not just because of its importance, but also because there are a lot of people who think differently on that. So how does one become a Christian? This is a, a, an important difference, right? What do I do after conversion? You know, do I have to stay faithful? Am I always saved after conversion, right? That's another important issue. Uh, these two issues are maybe in a way a little bit more important than this. But again, because we are sort of known for not using musical instruments, it is an important difference from, uh, with us from other different people that claim Christianity. And it is an important difference, right? It is an important difference to talk about. That's what we're going to do this morning. You know, thinking about the frequency of how many people bring this up, we always want to give an answer for what we do and do it in a proper way. Think about what Peter said, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, right? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Right? We think about that phrase there, right? Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks if you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, the right type of mindset. Even though that's not, the context is not talking about musical instruments, there is the point being made is that we need to be able to give an answer for what we do. And that's what we want to try to do this morning. Maybe if you have studied this a lot, maybe you can, maybe this helps in terms of learning some more things about how we can I uh, talk about the usage of musical instrument and instrumental music in worship. Again, this is not going to exhaust the list. There are, there are several other reasons we could talk about for time's sakes. We're just going to focus on really two main things to think about. Instrumental music usage in the Old Testament and instrumental music usage in the New Testament. So let's talk about, first of all, instrumental music in the Old Testament. All right, let's first think about the example of David. We know David is a in a way, he was a musician. He uh, had a habit, he had a hobby, we might could say, of writing songs. A lot of the psalms are written by him. We know that it was David that played before King Saul and soothed his uh, soul, soothed his spirit. So David had a lot of, David had a lot of usage uh, with, with music. He, he often wrote music, he understood music. But we want to think about the example of David in light of 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. Now, we do want to talk about, for a moment, what's going on here. First Chronicles 15, we've got a chapter that's devoted to the Ark of the Covenant moving from uh, Kerjath-Jerim all the way to Jerusalem. We'll talk about how the Ark gets to Kerjath-Jerim next or Wednesday night in Bible class. But in First Chronicles 15, the Ark is leaving that city, going to Jerusalem. 
At this point, David has conquered Jerusalem. David's going to make Jerusalem the capital. They're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant there. And as we talked about in Wednesday night Bible class, once Joshua the best Shemite saw the Ark coming, he and all those around him were excited about that. The people were excited that the Ark of the Covenant was moving to Jerusalem. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. Again, there's going to be a big celebration around this, carrying of the ark. Now, David rightly points out that it was the Levites' responsibility to, do, to carry the ark because the Lord had chosen them to do that. But it's interesting, as we move on down, he will, we see an instance of where he's going to uh, introduce uh, instrumental music. We want to note David's command. And it's important that we note that this is David's command. Verses 15 and 16. The children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses had com commanded according to the word of the Lord. All right, note, Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. Pay attention to that. David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments and music, psalteries and harps and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. Now, it's interesting to note there in, that ver in those two verses, while, whereas you see the carrying of the ark, how it was done according to the word of the Lord, you don't see that same emphasis being put on what David tells the chief of the Levites to do. So David is introducing something here that apparently God had not uh, specifically authorized. So we might think to ourselves, well, what's the big deal here? Right? You think about Nadab and Abihu, they certainly altered the worship of the Lord. They were punished for it immediately for doing that. David here is not immediately punished for that, so... Some people would come to the conclusion, well, this means that God approved of it, that God specifically approved of it. So what would be the big deal? Well, one thing that we want to point out in, in regards to this, uh, we want to talk about how the Bible uh, remembers this, some, some passages from the Bible. There are a few that we could look at, but I want to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 26 through 27. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David, and the priests with the trumpets, and Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and, the, and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. Now what's important to note about these two verses is look who is being given credit for the introduction of instrumental music, at least in the, in the worship of the Israelites, right? It's not, it's not God, right? It's the instruments of David. That word of is possessive. Right, if I if someone's if I were to say that I'm the child of Wayne and Tanya, well, that knows that uh, Wayne and Tanya are my parents. There's a certain uh, sense of possession, especially when I was a younger kid. Right, that, that I'm their kid. Same things being accredited to David here. This is not God who had done this. This is David who had implemented instruments in the worship of Israel. There, at the end of the verse, the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. So it's important to note as we talked about 2 Corinthians or 2 Chronicles or 1 Chronicles 15, whereas the carrying of the ark, the Bible specifically mentioned that that command came from God, even though it came through Moses, it came directly from God because God spoke to Moses. Note that when it's remembering the instruments used in the, the Israelite worship, God's not given the, the uh, credit for giving the command. It's David who's being attributed to that. So that's important to remember. It probably indicates to us that David did this without getting the approval of God. We also want to consider the words, and this, this goes along with it, consider the words of Amos. Amos chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now the book of Amos, uh, the nation of Israel is dealing with a lot of problems. Amos is one of the, uh, one of the prophets that was to the northern kingdom. Uh, and Israel has a lot of problems. Uh, Amos chapter 6, verse 1 Amos says to them, Woe to them that are, that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. We know, of course, about the worship of the northern kingdom. Jeroboam set up altars in Dan and Bethel, and really wanted to prevent the Israelites from going down to Jerusalem to worship God in the temple. So he, he came up with that innovation. Uh, but Amos here is talking to the nation of Israel, and he, 
and, and through the words of God, because Amos is inspired, he, God has a problem with them, right? Woe to them are, that are at ease in Zion. The, the concept of woe is not a good thing. It's always indicative of punishment or judgment to come. Those that trust in the mountain of Samaria, those that, that, that trust in the capital of Samaria, again, Israel was a very wicked nation. And you can see in the verses following some of the problems that they have, but we want to note Amos chapter 6, verse 5. One of the problems that God had with the nation of Israel, it says in Amos 6, verse 5, that those that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. Now that's interesting, right? Let's, I don't have those verses up here, but let's look at Amos chapter 6 real quick. Because I want to point out some of the problems that God had with the nation of Israel at this point. get there in my Bible. There we go. Amos chapter 6. You know, look through these verses and look at some of the problems that they have, right? Uh, verse 3, Woe to the, you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seed of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. People that are essentially unconcerned about the spiritual state of Israel. That, that's what's being described here. People that are unconcerned with the spiritual state of Israel you see down in verse 7, the end result of that, therefore they shall go captive as the first of captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be moved. People that have no concern about their spiritual uh, condition. Well, what's interesting is in, in sight of all of that, and you think about what the prophets condemned for what Israel had done, one of the things that Amos points out that God had a problem with apparently was that they, as it said, invented to themselves instruments and music like David, which seems to further indicate that while a lot of people like to go to the Old Testament to say that, well, since David in implemented instruments of music and worship, we can do the same thing. What it turns out in the Old Testament, it looks like God does not condone that, which is one, one point that we can bring out why we as Christians uh, don't use musical instrument in worship. Even though David did that, we don't have the authority to act on David. On, on, uh, we don't have the authority to act as David did. Again, we think about why innovation was the problem there, right? God had a problem with that. Uh, as he's pointing out the problems that Israel had, one of those problems is, again, is the same thing that David had done, invented instruments and music to himself, right? So innovation is a, pro innovation is a problem. Then we do want to ask the question again, is the, is the law of Moses still binding, right? We want to consider Paul's words. I know some of that has already popped up on the screen. Consider Paul's words, you know, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul talks about that the handwriting of ordinances, a reference to the law of Moses, that was against us is nailed to the cross. It's made of none effect. Galatians chapter 5, Paul's talking about the fact that we as Christians are freed from the law of Moses. We are freed. We don't no longer have to serve that. As Romans 6 in chapter 7 we've talked about in Bible class, Galatians 5, we are freed from the law of Moses. We don't have to observe it anymore. Paul says specifically, stand, therefore, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith you have been called. Right? Freedom in the law of Christ rather than the law of Moses. We no longer serve that. Consider the words of Jesus, though. Right? Matthew 28, verse 20. We know this is the Great Commission, but we don't often think about the Great Commission in this way. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The emphasis being on the word I. Right? Whatever I have commanded you. What Jesus has said is what's important. John 12, verse 48, Jesus told his disciples, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, what are Matthew and John getting at? They're, the point that they're getting at is that the words of Jesus matter. The writer of Hebrews reaffirms that, that the words of Jesus matter more than what the law of Moses said because we are no longer under the law of Moses. And so if we want to, uh, if we want to have the confidence when we appear before Christ on the day of judgment, we have to do the things that he has said. We have to follow what his commands have said based on those two verses. And so what that indicates to us is that the law of Moses today is not binding for the Christian. And so we can't go back to the Old Testament to try to justify instrumental music and worship service. So the law of Moses is not binding. That is a resounding no to the answer to that question. So we don't rely on the law of Moses. Let's think about the New Testament. 
Right? What about the apostles? What did the apostles tell the church? That's what we want to think about. We think about that in light of, you know, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. After Peter makes that confession that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah, we read that Jesus gave unto them the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He was giving them their, giving them authority. And we see that in Acts chapter 2, that when the apostles go and preach on the day of Pentecost, they are filled with the Spirit. Right? They are inspired as they're speaking. And they were given that authority. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we read about the early church, what they were doing. They were continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And the point being is that the New Testament church were following the words of the apostles who were inspired by God. They were doing what God said. So we want to pay attention to what the apostles said about music or singing in worship. Let's look for a moment at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, Colossians 3, 16. Again, these are familiar passages in light of what we're talking about. Ephesians 5, verse 19, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So when you're thinking about that, what it brings out to us is one thing that we know we do is we sing, right? That's a command that is clearly given in both of those verses, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We, uh, we admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing is a definite command that we have to carry out. We know, we know what that is. But we, what we also want to think about is the emphasis that's being put on teaching here, Right? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? I'm not just, certainly I'm speaking to myself, but I'm not just speaking to myself. I'm, I'm in the process of edifying all that are around me, right? Colossians 3, 16, teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The emphasis being put not just on the singing, but what singing accomplishes. It teaches, right? That's why the, the songs that we sing, the, the reason why we think about those songs that we sing is because part of that is we teach one another in the process of doing that. You think about when it comes to instrumental music, you know, we can't really teach one another just by notes, right? Words, words are what matter when it comes to the song. When John, in John chapter 6, the apostles have, have come to Jesus, and, he, and Jesus is asking them in light of others who had departed from him, Jesus is asking, will they also depart away from him? And Peter said, how can we depart from you? For you have the words of eternal life. He didn't have the music of eternal life. He had the words of eternal life because the words are what matter. The words are what teach. And that's one of the important things we want to bring out. Why singing matters is because we teach one another in the process. That's what words accomplish. Some would say Ephesians 5 verse 19, making melody in your hearts, uh, that opens the door for instrumental music. Because when you think about melody, you think about how that is the combination of not just singing, but it also is the combination of instruments along with the singing. But the important thing about Ephesians 5 verse 19 is, is the making of melody in your hearts to the Lord. And that phrase, the, when you go back and look at the, the idea of making melody, the, the Greek word carries the idea of, of plucking. And there are a lot of people that have assumed from that that what's being stated by Paul is the plucking of an instrument. But we do keep in mind that the making of melody is being done in the heart. You know, I can't, there's not an instrument in my heart that I pluck, right, when I, when I start to sing. The, the emphasis being put on the spiritual state of the person that's doing the singing, right? The, the emphasis being on the heart, not a, not a physical instrument. So let's, uh, let's think about some maybe possible objections. And I know this isn't under the objections, but it, it can kind of fit in that way. Because there are some people that would, that would sort of dismiss both of those verses. One way that they might dismiss it is that, you know, how do we know that this was in the assembly? You know, how do we know that this is not something else? Like Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. And we read about them singing at midnight. How do we know that this is something outside of the assembly? Well, for that, we want to turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we talked about this context a little, uh, a couple weeks ago, about how what's going on here, Paul's dealing with the problems in the church of Corinth. Some of their problems it stem from when they came together. 1 Corinthians 11, when they partook of the Lord's Supper, they were having problems there. 
but they were also having problems with the usage of miracle, uh, miraculous gifts in the assembly as well when they came together. When you go and you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that's, that's one of the things that we want to point out that this context begins. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, Paul says, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. Know this, since you come together, not for the better, for the worst. For first of all, when you come together as a church, the emphasis on that section, when you are coming together, that is the assembly that Paul's talking about there. He proceeds to talk about the Lord's Supper, but... What we notice is that even when he's talking about spiritual gifts, he's still addressing this same context of talking about the assembly. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 5 and 12. I hope you have your Bibles with you as you're reading this. I'm reading this from the New King James Version. I know some of this is coming from the King James Version. But 1 Corinthians 14, verses 5 and 12. Paul's talking about miraculous gifts here, but, but notice the context. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more than that... But even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in, with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. The importance being that last phrase, the church may receive edification. Again, we talked about miraculous gifts ceased as evidenced by 1 Corinthians 13. The important part here for us, that the church may receive edification. We drop down to verse 12. Paul says, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And the point being here is that we clearly know that this is talking about the assembly. This is talking about when the church came together to worship God. So we know that that is exactly the context that's being talked about here. Now in light of that, let's look at verses 15 and 16 of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. Again, look in your Bibles. Verses 15 and 16. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? Verses 15 and 16, what's being talked about there? I will sing with the Spirit. All that's being discussed there is the singing. You don't read about the usage of musical instruments in light of that. I know in the verses prior, he uses that as an example, but he's using that in a secular setting. Whereas verses 15 and 16, when they came together, what we do know that they were doing is that they were singing. That was a part of what the worship that they were doing, that we know that they were singing, and that's what we can trust in. That's what they were doing, as what the apostles commanded them. That's apparently what God had wanted them to do as well, to sing. Let's also talk about some other possible objections real quickly. Uh, what about percussion and stringed instruments? And, that, and that's something that may come up, right? We think about a trumpet, a trombone, anything that you have to blow air into. You can't obviously play that instrument and sing at the same time. And so, you know, just, just from a very logistical standpoint, that, that, that point is uh, thrown out, right? Because I can't sing and do both. But some would argue that, you know, maybe because I sing, I can also play another instrument whether that's percussion or string, that doesn't require me to use my vocal cord. Well, again, what does the text say for us? Right? It says that they sang, that they, that they would sing. You don't read about any uh, indication of them playing instruments. God had a problem with David doing that, as evidenced by the Old Testament Scripture. Uh, but again, what we have in the New Testament, what we know for sure is that they did sing, and that's what we need to, to carry out. Someone also argued that instrumental music is merely an aid. Same way that they would say that using a psalm book is an aid or using that uh, a PowerPoint like what we're doing is, is simply uh, using an aid. And some people use pitch pipes to, to get pitch and, and things like that before they begin singing. But, you know, instrumental music, it really does change the nature of worship, right? If I use a psalm book, I'm still singing, right? But and certainly you think about what the book of Psalms was. It really was a psalm book. So people had that at their, their disposal. But you think about what instrumental music does, it does change the nature of worship because not only now do you have singing, but you've also got some foreign sound being introduced to, the, introduced to worship. Just like Nadab and Abihu introduced something foreign to what God had commanded, and they were punished. Just like David introduced something foreign, foreign to what God had commanded, and by the words of Amos, God had a problem with the Israelites doing what David did. So 
We have to do as what God had commanded, and that's what we ultimately rely on. The fact that the New Testament does say that we sing, we can trust in that, and that's the best option, to do exactly as what God said. And then for a moment, think about instrumental music in church history. That's one of the classes I'm preparing for. Uh, we, we, we talk about this a little bit, because uh, one of the things that's noted is that in the early stages of the church, you don't have a lot of re- you don't have any records of them using instrumental music. Uh, it's not really until about a few hundred years after the foundation of the church when you begin to see people recording and documenting the usage of instruments in worship. What that indicates is that it took several hundred years before uh, it took several hundred years for that to become a common practice, which indicates that the New Testament church apparently had never. Uh, had never used instrumental music in worship. And of course, we always want to rest in what Scripture says, what God has commanded. But I think that's an interesting thing to think about. If it didn't come about till several hundred years later, pretty, pretty clear indication that they weren't using musical instruments in worship in the New Testament church. So as we draw to close this morning, uh, we always want to keep in mind we need to handle differences in a delicate way. You know, this is not something... I mean, obviously we want to stand for the truth, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to be condescending. We don't want to be arrogant towards others. Uh, Hopefully I haven't been that way today. What I wanted to do was simply just sort of present what the Bible says in light of this question. Uh, Present, uh, giving a detailed look at at various passages of Scripture to give what God has said about that. And I think that's what we try to do with when we talk to others and we have differences about what the Bible says. We We try to go back and see what Scripture says, not what other men say, but what does Scripture say. And hopefully we we do that in a delicate way. We do that in a a respectful way for them, but at the same time we stand for truth. We always want to keep in mind, too, that the best option is God's command. If I know that God is told through the apostles, through inspiration, and the New Testament writers through inspiration, that the church was singing, I know that I need to do that. And that's the best option that I need to stick with. If God says I need to sing, I need to sing. And I know that I can always accomplish that objective as long as I'm singing. I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm doing what is right when I introduce instrumental music in worship. right? I, I'd have to worry about it in that sense because, you know, is this right or not? I know for sure that I can do what God said when I sing as God has exactly commanded in the New Testament. Again, we think about this issue We know that this is a very prevalent issue. I hope this has been beneficial for you. There are other reasons we could talk about, but for time's sakes, we'll stop here. Again, we want to be a part of the New Testament church. It's the first step in in, in terms of, you know, having the expectation of having an eternal home in heaven with God. We read about it in the Bible. The Bible is very clear about how I become a New Testament Christian, that I hear the word of God, that I believe in Jesus, that I repent of my sins, that I confess Christ, that I am baptized for the remission of my sins, And at that point, I continue to live faithfully for God because I want to have that home in heaven with Him. This morning, maybe you are in the position where uh, you strayed away uh, and you have fallen away from God. We're fortunate that we can have prayers made for the forgiveness of our sins when we stumble and fall if we're willing to repent of those sins. This morning, if you have any need, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?